Today I'm going to be reading through 2 Corinthians, and we're going to be going over chapter 4 today. And this is just, I'm reading through this, it's an encouraging word, it's an encouraging word to trust God, and it's the adversity that we're going to face as Christians following Christ, right? So, to begin, as always, just to give a little bit of background for those who may or may not have been reading through some things you realize about 2 Corinthians is that the author is Paul, and it's undisputed that he is the author. Now, there are some passages they, they talk about and question his authorship on, but they're pretty much easily dismissed since the way in which he, he writes in those particular sections is that in which he's quoting a collage of scripture. This, of course, is Saul of Tarsus, who persecuted Christians before running in the crescent of Damascus. And we know him often as we refer to him as the Apostle Paul. The date around which this was written was around 55 56 AD. This is about a year after 1 Corinthians and a year before Romans. The audience into which Paul is talking to is that of the Gentile church of Corinth. It's the capital. So we should I'm pretty sure we're going over and know about that at this point in time. The style in which he writes is in such a way that a reader, as we're going through this, we feel as if we're the traveling companion of Paul, the author. And some other things I've learned as I've been going through and reading is Paul founded this church in Corinth. It's his most personal letter, many would say, and it's hard to read because of the painful tension between Paul and the Corinthian church there. His original travel plans were that he was going to go from Ephesus to Macedonia and then to Corinth. And of course we know he had a lot of travels and some missionary journeys that he went through. He sends Timothy to Corinth and he of course comes back and he informs him of the, the church's dire situation that it's in. And it's a result of the enemies of the church, enemies of Paul at the time. And so he ends up going to Corinth itself directly. And his trip was painful because the church was openly rebellious against him and his teaching of the gospel. And so as we read throughout 2 Corinthians we see that it's a lot of Paul um, basically just defending his the fact that he's an apostle, that he's a disciple of Christ. There are many that argued or questioned his motives, right? There's partially we read uh, in the journeys he was collecting, right, givings, things of that matter, to carry it over into Judea because there was a hardship that some of the others that were going through, and he was trying to help alleviate that. People questioned his motives all around, his personal courage. He said he suffered too much to be a disciple of Christ. They looked at his life. They ran into those that were known as the super apostles we've heard about before. These false teachers who others would look at and, and how they live or that they had this secret message, right, or secret knowledge. And, of course, later on, Paul returns to Ephesus and he sends a letter back with Titus, another companion. And it warns them that God's judgment will come unless they repent, and of course they do indeed repent, the majority. So Paul had to go through a lot of stuff, and as we read through 2 Corinthians, I'm sure we'll pick up on that. And I think it's just an encouraging word to bring to everyone here, because in our life we encounter many things like that, living as Christ did, living as Paul did, who did exactly what he should, everything he taught, everything he lived, everything he did was mimicking Christ's likeness to a world that needs to see that. Some of the themes um, that I picked up on primarily in reading through some of the commentaries and texts is that there's a, a greater glory of the new covenant in contrast to the old. So we see that previously in the chapter we read the other day in chapter 3, or two days ago, chapter 3 where it talks about how if there was such a glory given to the law, how much greater to something that gives life. Mm -hmm. The glory of the gospel and the weakness of its ministers. And Paul constantly shows how he's weakness and he boasts in that. He shows that we're brokener than vessels and that how amazing that a powerful word is able to transform others mm -hmm. in their lives. And it's only because it's not of what he says or does or work, it's Christ working through him, and only Christ who can bring that about. A theme of endurance amid adversity and Christ-like behavior that's made possible by the grace of God 
and it's the greatest display of God's presence, power, and glory in this world in which we live, in the fallen, sinful world. In the theme of repentance, expressing itself in holiness, it's defined as a purity producing love for God and His church and unity creating love for one's neighbor. So I want to go ahead and begin by going and reading chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll go ahead and I'll have... Sean, why don't you go ahead and read that for us, would you? Therefore, since we have this ministry because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not, and not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves, before, uh, commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of, the, of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. go ahead and go back through verses 1 and 2 again. But therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Or Sean's verse, his version said, do not give up. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we will commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul's saying what we all need to listen to, that we should not lose heart or not give up. That the only reason he has this ministry is by the mercy of God. And as I spoke of before, he always likes to show his weakness to magnify God's mm -hmm. glory and his greatness. We know that ministry can be very tough. And Paul reminds us not to lose heart. He says, we don't tamper with the word of God which we all here would agree with, realizing this is the written word of God and not mm -hmm. the words of men. He's also speaking, as I gave the context earlier, to the naysayers of his day as well, to those who question his motives in his life. He's not motivated as some would read in their, in their word that by money or other means. He's speaking to the false teachers when he states verse 2. He's saying, we don't tamper with the word of God. <coughs> the open statement of the truth we will commit ourselves before the conscience sight of God so he's he's showing that it's only by God that he's able to do things he's giving glory to him and he refuses to change the word of God in any manner apart from its true meaning he's not going to dilute it or change it for tears liking mm -hmm. um, verses 3 through 6. Alright, we see it says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to show to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let sh light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul is talking about those who are unable to believe. Ones who, Paul clearly states, those who are perishing. People who are unable to see or recognize Christ as Lord. In verse 4, we read how he says, in their case, whose case? Hmm. The ones who cannot recognize hmm. Christ for who he is. The image of God. They're blinded by the God of this world. As we know, Satan, the prince of the air, as we read in other places. In verse 5, it says, what we proclaim, we, the believers, proclaim, 
is that we're not Lord, right? But Christ is Lord. Christ is God. And verse 6 shows, God said, let light shine out of darkness. God made it possible for us to be transformed and recognize who he is. So we realize that we should not lose heart, but take courage and trust in God, realizing he's sovereign over all. And as such, God will bring about his plan of redemption, a new creation amidst this sinful world, amongst this fallen world. And this should make us feel encouraged that regardless of the world's reaction to what we have to tell them, we should have that growing desire to share the gospel, the truth, more each day with the world in dire need. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the suppressing, surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Christ, so that the life of Christ, Jesus also may be manifested in our body for we who live are constantly being delivered over to the death of jesus sake so that the life of jesus may be manifested in our mortal bodies so death works in us but life in you thank you verse 7 it shows us how amazing god is he's able to carry out his plan there is my version saying jars of clay through these weak and earthen vessels, our bodies, or our humanity, who we are. One should see that a broken man, that, that Paul was, right, that we are, that Paul was, and, and just as we can only give the effective, life-changing word of God by the power of God himself. In verses 8 through 9, like when we see all these contrasting, we see this verb that's used, right, afflicted but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Let me ask you, have you ever been in a crowded area? You know, like a store? I'm sure most of us could say, you know, carnival, anything like that. We understand how some of these things could feel, right? We've been through circumstances where we feel that, but understanding where Paul's coming from, just to have that image, we can understand he's, he's saying, look, We've been to these points where we feel crushed, but we're not utterly destroyed, right? We're not killed. This imagery that's used, it's similar to in the Gospels, where Jesus has a large crowd pressing in. We're afflicted, but we're not crushed from nowhere to go. We may get perplexed, right? We may get a little confused, but not driven to despair. Verse 9 we're persecuted or pursued by others, but not forsaken by God. Maybe struck down, perhaps, like Paul was, by physical force. Someone throwing stones, being beaten with sticks or whips, but not completely destroyed. And as we're reflecting upon Paul in, in these images, right, we see he's been beaten and stoned, and we know that he was hated for Christ's namesake. All these things are not in vain, though. Just as Paul was afflicted, he was perplexed, he was persecuted, and struck down, as we've read many a times, we will experience these things as well in our own lives. If we live to serve Christ and follow Him, we should expect these things should happen someday, however, whatever form they may take. But the beautiful thing is that we know we are not forsaken, and that the contrast shows we will overcome with divine strength as we go through these things, as we experience these things. In verses 10 through 12, we see how we will suffer as Christ did, as we see that parallel now of Christ's life, with that realization that we will one day be glorified together with Him. Paul displays these hardships experienced by Jesus in his own life as well. He was willing to suffer, to endure adversity, so that he may spread the powerful and salvific message of the gospel to the Corinthians and others. We too should 
should want that, should want verse 11 and 12. To live is always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the light of Christ may be manifest in our own mortal flesh. We may bring others to see, to believe the word of God. Go ahead and continue into verses 13 through 15. Here we have this summary. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul summarizing how we too should have faith according to what is written here in the Bible, that we should trust God and hold to our proclamation of faith as we see that power in Christ's resurrection and its meaning to us and to others. Mm-hmm. He realized that he too would be resurrected along with the Corinthians, who would all give God glorifying thanksgiving to the one who saved him. We saw this in the in the Old Testament, as we all know, it just brought to mind how Abraham, and it talks about that in various places, and one being in Hebrews, where he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So it's just amazing. We always see these things all throughout the Scripture. We see it in Old Testament and New Testament. Except now Paul speaks as part of the New Covenant. He realizes what Christ has done as he looks forward to that, an increasing number of praises from those who respond in increasing number to the gospel message that he's given. Go ahead and read verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is the second time we see in this chapter where he states we do not lose heart, or as earlier we heard the translation, we do not give up. Paul is showing how though our outer self our outer man, our physical, essentially visible bodies are passing from this life, we have something more precious which is unseen. We have the inner man which is flourishing, growing because of the Holy Spirit within us as the text says day by day. Again, how amazing though that our bodies, though they decay day by day, it's, it's not in vain. Unlike those who are perishing without the hope in the realization that we have of the truth that we have. If we go back to 17 and 18, when it talks about this life momentary affliction, it's preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. I like what some commentaries mention here about what Paul had said earlier, because as we've read about these things, such as in verses 8 through 9, where it said that we were afflicted, we were crushed, perplexed, things of that, we see here when it says earlier, Paul, Paul's suffering was a burden too heavy to carry, but now it's a light momentary affliction whenever he views eternity. It's, it's just like in our life, whenever constantly we need to be reminded, I know myself need to be reminded of this as well, that we need to, to look to heaven, have our minds set to heaven, and realize that in light of all these things that may be happening to us in our life, that it's but a moment. And it's beyond all comparison when you realize the, the weight of glory to come. In the same light, um, is what we read earlier where it talks about Paul's suffering and burden and how it's a light affliction now. Calvin makes the following statement in reference to the verse as well. He says for a moment is long if we look around us on this side and on that but 
When we have once raised our minds heavenward, a thousand years begin to appear to us to be like a moment. I love how he puts these things. He, I, I know I need, like I said before, I need to be reminded of this daily. And so when we have things, just like I know Matt's pretty aspiring that every day, he, he gives us these messages of hope and, and things to constantly reflect upon throughout the week, and I'm thankful for that. So we see that as verse 17, these things are but light momentary afflictions and preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We will all experience these afflictions in one light or another. Paul experienced many sufferings, many tribulations, and everything he said and, and he did as we're reading. We can recall his accounting gives in 2 Corinthians 11, 20-28. And uh, I know Craig has has preached on this before and he basically gives an account saying you know listen I've done all these things here's my resume I'm this mm -hmm. I'm a great guy I've been you know Hebrew and Israelite that of the tribe you know <clears throat> all these things but he realizes it's nothing with scuba compared to what he has now with Christ he recalls his account and he says he was imprisoned he was beaten with rods various objects near death exposed to the 40 lashes minus one stoned, three times shipwrecked, countless dangers experienced and without food. We read about the stoning he went through, right? He mentions that he was stoned once. We saw that in the book of Acts, where the people flew his Iconium and Lystra, Iconium and some other people of the area, influenced those to turn against Paul and stone him. And they thought he was dead and they drug him outside of the city. He appeared to be dead and then amazingly rose up. The disciples you know, came around him, saw him. He rose up and was alive. And the text says the next day went with Barnabas to Derby. They preached the gospel there before returning to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, strengthening and encouraging others to, in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. They believed in the Lord. And brothers and sisters, we will experience many things in our journey as well. But we must not lose heart. We can't forget what Scripture shows us, that those who follow the same path should expect these things and it will occur. We should take joy in the eternal weight of glory, that beyond all comparison as we see, we, we look to the things that are unseen, we realize what's to come. We've got to, to, to realize in regards to the gospel, we may suffer and we probably will suffer. I know many of us have experienced this in one way or another in relationships. Maybe we've talked to people about the gospel and what the word says, right? We listened last night where there was a lot of it's a lot of heart, but there wasn't really any gospel. We have these difficult discussions. Maybe we have things we suffer in with our jobs. And just in life itself in many forms. And I really just want to take a moment to say there, there are those I know that need encouragement who feel that, well, they, they look at somebody like maybe me up here or Sean or another brother or sister in Christ. And they say, well, I can't really be used because, well, I'm older or I don't really have a spiritual gift. And we've been talking about this, so we should know what that is or have some ideas of it. We may be experiencing some sort of pain, maybe it's medical, you know, some physical thing we've been dealing with for a long time and we feel like we can't be used, but I want to encourage you and say you can be used and you never know who that is. There are so many people that have these stories they talk about, but how much greater when we realize that as Christians we can be used by God regardless because when we realize that we're just broken earthen vessels, God's using us to His glory. And we can live Christ-like. We can show other people what that is. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. where you're at, who you are. If you are a Christian, if you've truly repented and followed Christ, you recognize where you stand. And you look to God and you say, man, beyond all comparison, no matter what I'm going through, whatever tragedy, whatever pain, no matter what it is, where I'm at, you can be used. So don't just sit off on the sideline, but be encouraged that God can use us. And he does mm -hmm. use us. All throughout the scriptures, we see that. And so I just wanted to take a moment to say that, if that's you. If, if you feel, oh, I can't do much because I have, I don't know, so just many illnesses that people struggle with. Don't let that 
stop you. Don't let that impede you from doing things for the kingdom of God because you may be the very person that God uses to cause someone to come and read the word of God and fall to their knees and humbly repent and confess and, and cry out to God. Realize that. It's God who does the work. We must take heart and trust in God and constantly reflect upon eternity, upon, as we read with Calvin and other commentaries, the heavenly things, as we know to always focus upon those. Paul suffered. He had people question everything he did. They mocked him. They said, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Right? That's from 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, so for any other people reading ahead. Um... It's, it's tough. It's a rough thing. You know, he, there was a lot of things people experienced, but don't let that discourage you. Don't give up. You've got to take heart. And I have to remind myself of that as well because I struggle with just as many things as anyone else here. There's things daily that I need to pray for and be prayed for. He went through all these things. He had a church that he founded that openly rebelled against them. People have been won over by these super apostles and these false teachers for a time we see. But thankfully, by the grace of God, many eventually repented, as it says. Mm -hmm. It was the majority, though there were still the minority that followed other leaders that opposed Paul and his gospel that he gave, and essentially rejected the gospel. He went and, of course, wrote another letter, because he knew mm -hmm. these things. But we just need to be aware of it. God is still working. Mm -hmm. God is doing things, even if we see it or not. As it says, we... We look to the things that are unseen, aren't, and the unseen they are, that are unseen are eternal. We've got to look to Paul as an example of just one of our brothers in Christ. More importantly, to Christ, whom we should all hope to become more like with each passing day. Mm -hmm. And we've got to realize that we just need to count it all as joy as we realize these things we experience are not new, but reflect the life well, we're going to experience and if they too have truly repented and followed Christ we should just count that all as joy and, and know that the numbers are going to increase and they were going to glorify God and thank God for the salvation they had so I just wanted to, to share that with everyone today that I just hope it's encouraging that's an encouraging message is one we, we see what other brothers of the faith have gone through in their lives and realize that we have the light, as it says, of the gospel, the true gospel. That though we may feel a certain way about our circumstance or life, that God's sovereign over, mm -hmm. over these bodies of ours that we have, these jars of clay. And he's going to sovereignly save the elect, the others. We will experience these trials, but as people look at us in our own lives and as a church, I pray that they too would realize that the people of Corinth did, that such broken vessels we may be, the only reason the amazing life-giving message is effective is not due to our speech and our works, but that the transforming power of the Word is a result of God Himself using us and working through us. We realize that life is but a mist as we read, and we'll experience these afflictions, but we need to constantly reflect and realize that's beyond comparison to the joys to come. Remember what Christ has done for us, how he redeemed us from our sinful ways and bore the wrath of God upon the cross. So we need to go out and spread the truth of the gospel and realize no matter what the outcome may be, we know what's to come. Trust in God and don't lose heart to a blind and dying world. Grow in urgency to spread the word regardless of the cost. 